So we looked at the definition of a limit. We're going to look a little bit more at the intuitive idea of what it means for a vector value function to approach a point. So when R of t approaches x0, y0, and z0, what that really means is R of t has three components, xt, yt, zt. And when it approaches, all that means is individually, these functions are getting close to those three numbers right there. So it's sort of like three limits in one. There's an x, y, and z limit going on. So let's do a easy example. So we'll find limit t approaches pi over 4, r of t, and r of t equals cosine t, sine t, and t. All right, when we take this limit, there's really three pieces to it. And each of these are going to be nice. There's no divide by zero, undefined issues. Individually, the component functions are all continuous. We will look at what continuous means very soon, but individually, the x, y, and z functions are continuous. So we can just take, uh, just put the pi over four in for these three values. R of t is a vector. Or, well, or a point. It doesn't matter what you think of it as. Whatever works at the time. So we have 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2, pi over 4. All right, so that's our limit right here. So a function r going from the real numbers to rn is continuous at t naught. Exactly when the limit t approaches t naught r of t equals r of t naught. So the definition of continuous is exactly the same as it is for regular functions. The only difference is what we're comparing are two vector valued functions instead of just two numbers. But written down, it looks exactly the same. So a function r of t is continuous on the interval i if any t inside the interval r of t is continuous at t. So you're continuous on interval if you're continuous at every point in the interval. You can have left and right continuity using one side of limits at the ends, but I'm not gonna go that far into uh, details of that. <coughs> so continuous on interval versus continuous at a point. And CTS means continuous.
So a vector valued function is continuous exactly when all of its component functions are continuous. So if it is continuous exactly when all of its component functions are continuous, what happens if one of the component functions is not continuous? And then it's not continuous, so it only takes one to break it. So if one of the component functions is not continuous, then the whole function r of t is not continuous. So you can't have two of three being continuous. That's not enough. It has to be all three component functions. So after we look at continuous and limits, we're going to look at rate of change and then, of course, derivatives. So that's where we're going next. So let's do an average rate of change. So we'll use the notation delta r equals r of t plus delta t minus r of t. So that will be change in r. And if we want a change in r over change in time, delta r over delta t, that's really the average. So above is how much r changes, and if we want the average rate, we have to divide by the amount of time that passed. So there's our rate of change. So if we have a starting and ending point, and then our curve is going to go between them, and it'll be oriented to the right. So what I drew in the blue marker is the average rate of change. Or what delta r is, the, is that vector, delta r divided by t is a scaled version of that vector. And of course, delta r is not the total distance traveled because it just goes straight line distance, beginning minus end. And at the beginning, we have r of t, and then r of t plus delta t. So ready for the derivative, r prime of t. So also written d over dt, r of t. And how do we originally get our derivative before we knew all those fancy rules? Took a limit. So we use. So this is called the difference quotient. So we're going to subtract two different r values. So it'll be r of t plus h minus r of t. So we're looking at average rate of change, but we're looking at it over a very small time interval. And then we're taking a limit as that time goes to zero. So this is exactly our derivative, where our derivative came from before. So it's just our difference quotient. So let's talk about what's different with the difference quotient. I'll zoom in a little further on the difference quotient. All right, is h a number? So it's a number. So we're dividing by a number. So that's basically acting like a scalar, scaling it. 
Now what about the numerator? What's the output for the R function? So there are two vectors or two points, however you want to think about it, and we subtract them, it's the vector in between those two points. So the numerator is a vector. So we're doing point minus point, which will give a vector. So our limit is now a vector, or a scaled vector, which is still a vector. So that's very different from before. Before our derivative was a number, now our derivative is a vector. And there is another way we can write this out if we want to write it in component functions. You could write it as, so in vector form, go d d t x of t i plus d d t y t j plus d d t z t, oop, I should go i, no, i j k. Okay. And we took time derivatives already with the dot in this class. I think we did that. So I can write that as x dot i plus y dot j plus z dot k. That's another way to write it. Or, of course, write it in vector form. Lots of different ways to write the derivative. These are all r prime of t. Now, when I write r prime of t, I'm taking a t derivative, so it would make sense to call this r dot as well. So I can put the dot on top of a vector value function as long as it's a t derivative. So when we looked at derivatives originally, we looked at derivative as a rate of change, and if we took the position, the derivative of the position function would be the speed, or the velocity. And that's still true now. So an R of T represents the position of a particle, our prime of t represents the velocity. So if we look at that curve that was drawn earlier, beginning and ending, if I pick some point along the way, I'll pick this point right here, what color do you use for velocity? Blue? All right, we'll go blue. So the most fun way to think about it is if you're, there's a few ways to think about this. If you think about you're driving a motorcycle, that works pretty well. You could also think about if you're ice skating, that also has a good way to, to think about this. And if you're ice skating along the curve and then all of a sudden you slip, what is going to happen? What direction are you going to travel if you slip? Meaning there's no friction anymore, so you're not turning. You're going to keep going the direction you were traveling. So if we're moving along here, and I slipped right at this blue point, the direction we're currently moving would be right about there. So you started turning a little bit, but if you slip right there, you'll just keep going straight. Now, if you're in an ice skating rink, you probably hit the wall. So hopefully there's no wall right there. Yeah, but we're not quantum particles, so. <laughs> yes, I am teaching, uh, what's the other not quantum mechanics? General relativity. 
It's not really general relativity. It's just Euclidean movement. But it would fall under general relativity. Wait, you teach that? No, I don't teach that. Oh. I'm just not teaching quantum mechanics. <laughs> No, I could not teach that. All right, so this vector right here just represents the direction that particle is traveling instantaneously. All right, so I'm going to put on a couple more points right here, and I want you to draw the velocity vectors at these other points here. They're not all going to go the exact same direction. They'll be kind of close, but they won't all go to the same direction. And for a length, you can just use the length you drew for your first arrow. So I'm going to use this neat little ruler. And what I'm going to do is look at tangents. All right, so a good way to think about a tangent is it touches in one point. So I'm trying to line that ruler up right on that point so it would touch in one point. And then if I would draw the tangent, if I could draw straighter lines, it would look something like that right there. That would be the tangent line. But for the velocity, we're taking the velocity is always going to exist inside that line, and it's going to be a directed arrow or a vector. So the direction it's going represents the direction of movement, and the length or the magnitude represents the speed, how fast. So it's a tangent vector. You could make a line out of it, uh, but it has, <coughs> it has more information than just a line. It doesn't just have a direction. It's which way are you going and how fast. So the way I drew all of these vectors, it looks like we're traveling at constant velocity, more or less. I drew them all very similar length. If we were speeding up, they would be getting longer. If we were slowing down, they'd all be getting shorter as we go along. So while we're defining different quantities, R prime is the velocity. So I could write V of T equals R prime of T equals R dot. So that's velocity. How do I get speed from velocity? So speed's just the magnitude or length. So speed, I don't think we use, no, oh, looks like my notes have S of T. Speed will be S of T, which is the magnitude of V of T or the magnitude R dot of t, or magnitude r prime of t. Lots of different ways to write this down. So that's speed. Now acceleration. How do we get acceleration? Take a derivative. So that'll be the derivative of velocity. So we'll use a of t for acceleration. So that you could write as v dot or V prime T, you could go back to R using a double derivative, so two dots, or R prime prime of T. Is that magnitude or speed? What's that? For speed, is that magnitude? Speed is, yeah, magnitude. So that's acceleration, and then We could write jerk. So it'll be J of T. So that's the derivative of acceleration, or A dot, which is V double dot, or R triple dot. Now, as you can tell, once you go past three dots, it gets a little bit silly. So you probably don't want the seventh derivative in dot notation. I don't know that there's. What's that? Yeah, that is a smiley face, V dot. <laughs> so there is going to be another uh, thing we, we will use a lot, which is the unit 
velocity. And how would I get the unit velocity? I want to know the direction we're traveling, but ignoring how fast we're going. So I'm going to get the unit velocity, so we're going to use velocity and divide by its magnitude. So that's how we're going to get the unit velocity. And that's also called direction of travel. And I don't think there's a letter for this. So we'll just write it as V over magnitude V. What type of velocity would not have a direction? So if you're not moving, you can't talk about a direction. You'd have an undefined direction. Ready for our first computation, uh, derivative computation. find velocity, acceleration, speed, and unit velocity of the curve R of t equals 2 cos t, 2 sine t, 5 cos squared t. Once you have all those, find the t value where the particle experiences maximum acceleration. So the first two things to compute are the two derivatives. When in doubt, take derivatives. So that's true again in calculus class.
Or any derivative questions? So we're about to find some magnitudes. We'll leave that till tomorrow. How do we, or not tomorrow, Monday, how do we maximize anything? Take derivative. Take derivative, set it equal to zero, and figure out what t value gives you a zero derivative. Now, we're gonna be maximizing acceleration, so what we're gonna have to do is take the magnitude of the acceleration, and then find when the magnitude's the largest. So that's what we're gonna have to do first.